Who wants to learn about EMG testing? You do? Okay, let's still learn about EMG testing. Thanks, guys. All done. Hi, it's Andy, and I'm here to give us our first lecture on electromyography. So let me get my <clears throat> screen shared. Um, I hope you all see that. Um, our goal with this lecture is to have you just understand the concepts of what we're doing from both a clinical and a technical standpoint. So um, EMG is a whole career. People make a life time of management and learning, uh, but the basics are something you really can learn in a couple of weeks, just to the point where you're sort of practical. So that's what we're gonna work on here. Um, here's a guy, 45 year old guy with low back pain, radiates into his feet for two months. His MRI shows a disc bulge. Whose MRI doesn't show a disc bulge? He's an assembly worker, he's obese, he's diabetic crosses his legs a lot. So as a clinician, you're going, well, is this a herniated disc? Is this diabetic neuropathy? Because back pain occurs in everybody, right? Uh, is he crossing his legs, getting a peroneal nerve palsy at, at his fibular head, right? And, and so you start thinking, getting an EMG. So the big question is, you know, is, is EMG any good for carpal tunnel, back pain, myopathy, tingly feet? And, and it's really the, the wrong question, okay? The really important question is all this kind of details. Does EMG really have no false positives? You know, if it's positive, could you bet your house on it? Does it miss some things? Okay. People wonder if EMG can detect effort or fatigue or force or pain, right? Um, there's a, a folklore that you'll understand better over time about whether you have to wait a month after an injury to find something on an EMG test and you'll learn the sophisticated answer to that. Um, can we tell more than the presence of the lesion? Can we say how bad it is? Can we say how long it's been around? Can we predict where the future will be? Um, and, and, and then I think that, that you wanna first, as you start looking at EMG, look at it like a consumer and say, hey, did, did the EMG test that I looked at get the job done, okay? so. Um, it, as I said, EMG is really a field of medicine. Um, uh, this is uh, the end of September 2021. And in two weeks, I'll be flying out to Denver to the AANEM meeting where a couple thousand neurologists and physiatrists uh, uh, are doing this testing. Um, in other countries, there is a, a different specialty of neurophysiology that's neither neurology nor physiatry. In the US, uh, a neurologist graduates from their program with maybe a month of EMG training. A physiatrist typically has three months, always has three months, maybe six months, uh, maybe a couple hundred cases. And so in our country, the people who become the specialists doing this at an academic level or at a competent level are either neurologists who go on to do another year of fellowship or physiatrists who may not do another year of fellowship because our training is pretty extensive. Um, a, a lot of historical reasons behind that. The quality of the test depends on a lot of different factors that we'll get to know. So I want you to understand some of the technical stuff, understand some disease stuff, and be able to judge the quality of an EMG without necessarily memorizing the anatomy, which you'll get going on over time because it's part of your career. Um, when you look at a peripheral nerve complaint, you want to think about the person in a very systematic way. You want to think about a, a tingly hand. You know, is it from a stroke? Is it from a brainstem lesion? Is it from a cervical stenosis, a multiple sclerosis? Tingling wouldn't be the anterior horn cells, but you know, you think about anterior horn cell disease with the, with these things. You go further down and wonder about a nerve root problem, uh, the brachial plexus. A lot of reasons for that. Uh, a focal mononeuropathy, you know, is this something here? Is it carpal tunnel syndrome? Is it the ulnar nerve? Polyneuropathy, is this a diabetic polyneuropathy or one of the many different uh, complex polyneuropathies out there? Uh, not with numbness, but with weakness. Is there a neuromuscular junction problem like myasthenia gravis or uh, Lambert-Eaton myasthenic syndrome, which is a complication usually of cancer? Um, is there a muscle disease? And then if you're being a really good physiatrist, you say, yeah, or it, did they just get a, a tendonitis, decorvanes tenosynovitis? And the reason why they have pain on their thumb is because the tendon's irritating them, right? So you need to 
always use this mindset. When I see a patient after all these years, I still look from the head down to the foot for a couple of different clues to understand what, where along the path the problem might occur. And it pays off pretty often. Um, our laundry list of the different things that we look for in the upper limb and the lower limb. And I think it's fair enough to say that this list that we'll go through here is something that you do need to have some competency about what these diagnoses are and how you would figure them out clinically. And, and over time, if you're doing more electromyography, you need to know how to do the EMG workup for each of these things, the, the normal values for nerve conduction in the carpal tunnel. Uh, uh, you know, where would you find the conduction block for a Saturday night palsy when somebody's resting on the radial nerve? So this list is, is a useful list to just realize when you're done with training, you need to be competent at understanding these diseases. In the lower limb, uh, the plexus, the sciatic nerve, uh, the, the peroneal tibial nerve, um, hip replacement surgery can cause obturator nerve palsies and nobody ever finds them because who tests adduction strength right after hip surgery, right? Um, and problems with impotence and cauticoina syndrome, stuff like that. Um, and of course, systemic illnesses, right? Uh, ALS, uh, polyneuropathies, et cetera. So you need to develop some level of competency and understand what these diseases look like clinically, you may, putting them in your differential diagnosis at the right place. And electromyographically, uh, at a minimum, understanding what they look like on an EMG and at a more competent level, being able to make that diagnosis when somebody comes in with a vague complaint, like my hand feels weak, right? So here's my model. This is a motor unit that's red and a motor unit that's blue. A motor unit is the anterior horn cell in the spinal cord and all of the muscle cells it innervates. Now, um, in any major muscle, there's a couple hundred muscle cells, not just three or four, but this model serves us pretty well here. Um, uh, this blue motor unit, uh, those four muscle cells fire and fire and fire, bump, 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 going along, right? The red one's different and it fires at a different rate and we'll come back to that, but they have different shapes. And, and when you do a needle EMG, you see different shapes of different motor units and you begin to recognize that one is different from another because they have different shapes and different firing rates. But let's talk about how we describe the shape of a motor unit. You look at how tall they are, you look at how fat they are, and you look at how many times they squiggle up and down and, and we'll call that phases or turns or baseline crossings. And so we'll talk later about polyphasic motor units. It means there's it's not just up and down, it's pop, up, 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 up and down, up and up, up and down, up and down, right? Um, when your needle is very close to a motor unit, there's a very steep rise time. Uh, if the needle is further away, it's more of a gradual wide thing. There's some dampening of the signal and stuff like that, which is why you can't do EMG from the surface. You gotta put a needle into the muscle, unfortunately, okay? When you activate a muscle, one muscle cell fires, or one nerve, good heavens, one motor unit fires, and it fires a little faster and a little faster and a little faster till it accomplishes what you want it to accomplish, whether that's lifting a pencil or raising a hand, right? And, and so the feedback from your peripheral nervous system tells you about whether you accomplish things. But if it's not getting the job done, a second motor unit jumps in, usually it's a little bit bigger. It's called the size principle. The first one is small because it gives you a little bit of power and they get bigger and bigger. And, and as that one goes faster and faster, a third motor unit comes on, right? So let's say we got rid of, of motor unit B because we have a partial nerve injury, okay? Well, you'll see that within a 10th of a second after the injury, if it's a partial nerve injury, because that first motor unit is firing like crazy before another motor unit, it's, it's not labeled B in, in, you know, in an EMG, but it's before anybody else comes in to help out, okay? And so, when, motor unit a, when a first motor unit is firing at 15 cycles per second or more without anybody coming out to help, there's a dropout of motor units or a terminology we use is called decreased recruitment, okay? So let's say we damage that blue motor unit. Well, within a 10th of a second, nothing happens except for dropout of motor units, okay? But over the course of a week, two weeks, three weeks, or four, four weeks, depending on the length of the nerve and where the injury is, eventually that axon dies down to the muscle cells and the neuromuscular junctions don't exist anymore. And the muscle cells begin to 
fire off on their own, kind of like smooth muscle or cardiac muscle does, okay? And so what you get here is a muscle cell that fibrillates, okay? And so you'll see in the, on the computer screen at the bottom, okay, the blue one is fibrillating. The, I think I do this on my picture here. So you've got a damaged nerve, a muscle cell is unplugged from the nerve, and that leads to fibrillations, which always on a, on a screen go down and then up. Every, everything that's bad goes down. If, if you're seeing it on a screen, it goes up and then down. It's, it's a motor unit or something else like that. If your needle's right on the edge of a fibrillation, it looks a little different in shape, and it's called a positive wave. And as far as we're concerned, they're exactly the same thing. They're both signs of a muscle cell whose membrane is irritable, right? Now, that's in our world almost always because a nerve been damaged and the neuromuscular junctions died off. But inflammatory myopathies can cause this. Direct trauma with bruising or even just putting blood onto a muscle can cause fibrillations. Uh, there are metabolic disorders that can cause fibrillations. Uh, so, so almost always in your context, uh, positive waves and fibrillations mean there's been some nerve damage, okay? Now, within some period of time, if this is an incomplete nerve injury, if the whole nerve isn't cut in half, um, then you still got this red one still working and it begins to sprout, okay? And have little, little terminal sprouts that attach to some of the blue one's muscle cells, okay? So that means this red one, instead of going pop, 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 it's going thwop, 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 because it's got a whole bunch of other stuff attached to it. Now, if you look at some of those new red lines, they're long. Huh? It takes a while to go from this point of go to here. So on that motor unit, they're stretched out further. Okay, That means there's gaps. That means that this motor unit looks like it goes up and down, up and down, up and down, polyphasic. Okay. Now, some of those, like these two blue ones down at the bottom, are actually pretty close to that center of where everything says go. And they're stacked on top. And so these are tall, okay, like you can see on my little model here. So uh, a subacute nerve injury will show tall, wide, polyphasic mode units, okay? Polyphasic is easy to see. Tall and wide, you're going to have to get to know what that means, okay? Um, hey, by the way, this little blue guy up on top, he's still not plugged in. And guess what he's still doing? Because he's not attached to anybody. He's still fibrillating. So a subacute injury, you'll often see positive waves and fibrillations. And when you ask the person to tense up the muscle, you'll see polyphasic mode units, okay? Over the long, long time, you know, these, these red new cables aren't actually longer because the nerve, nerve, the mode units are interdigitated with each other, okay? Uh, and what happens is they've got a, a really immature myelin. So the electricity goes jump, 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 jump. takes a long time going across a lot of little jumps. As the myelin matures, it goes jump, jump, maybe three jumps instead of 10 jumps to get there, it goes faster. So this is, there's our axonal sprouting. Um, at a later stage, maybe after a year or a couple of years, um, this thing kind of consolidates, okay? The myelin matures. So it's not so spread out in, in the long term. And somebody had a, a, a polio 20 years ago, somebody who had a bad radiculopathy that didn't recover 10, 15 years ago, you'll get mode units that are way bigger than they should be, uh, but they're not polyphasic, okay? And if all the muscle cells are plugged in, that's all you see. But if there's still some muscle cells not plugged in, there's your positive wave, there's your fibrillation again, except, you know, that muscle cell hasn't been working for a while, it's atrophied, right? It gets really small. And so when a injuries more than a year old, the fibrillation potentials are less than a hundred, uh, less than 50 microvolts. Okay. So you can tell, boy, that's an old denervation. That's not new denervation. Okay. Yep. Here's a different model for muscle disease. You can pick up muscle disease with an EMG. And the model is something like this. There's, there's my new motor unit I drew for you. And I put like 20 muscle cells on that motor unit, right? Let's go kill off some muscle cells. Ready, one, two, three, boom. Whoa, all the red ones are gone. So now this mode unit that used to look like this shadow up here is short, it's low amplitude, and it's polyphasic because there's gaps in it, okay? And so uh, it's kind of a no-brainer that you can see a myopathic mode unit, really little thing, 
or you can see a neuropathic moaning, which is way bigger than normal, right? So you can tell whether somebody has a myopathy. Obviously, proximal muscles, you find this more than in distal muscles. Um, sometimes there are fibs in myopathies because the inflammatory myopathies especially will cause muscle membrane instability. Anterior horn cell disease, uh, you know about fasciculations with anterior horn cells. And, and the way you think of a fasciculation is instead of a muscle cell fibrillating because it's not attached to the nerve, this is a lower motor neuron fibrillating because it's not attached to an upper motor neuron, right? And so when a nerve cell fibrillates, the whole darn motor unit fires and it's big and you can see it in somebody's tongue or you know, can of worms wiggling on their fingers and stuff like that. And you can see those from the surface. Um, if you've got a disease that's progressively killing off nerve cells, then those nerve cells friends are going crazy, sprouting out axons to help out. And so what you end up with is huge Modi and it's uh, normal in the hand might be two or 3000 microvolts. All of a sudden they're 10,000 microvolts and you just go, wow, that's really big. I got to adjust my, my machine to look at how big that is. Okay. Now fasciculations can happen for all kinds of things ranging from you got a bad night's sleep last night to any nerve problem, um, radiculopathy. Okay. Um, uh, to disease like ALS. Okay. So it's very important. Uh, that you test three limbs and, and the uh, uh, facial muscles outside of the spine because a cervical spinal cord irritation from, from um, stenosis could cause nerves irritated and fasciculations, right? So for ALS, you got to test muscles in three limbs and uh, the facial muscles. People with ALS are all spastic too. So you tap their reflexes and they jump and you're like, ah, oh, shoot, man, you've got a bad, bad disease. Not true with polio, which is another anterior horn cell disease, okay? Um, if you stimulate a nerve a lot of times real fast, it gets tired, okay? And there are standards for that. So if you stimulate uh, the ulnar nerve at two cycles per second, with anterior horn cell disease, something uh, that gave a response this big, gets kind of smaller a little bit, okay? Where it really gets smaller is with neuromuscular junction disorders. So ALS kind of affects the neuromuscular junction because there's so many freaking muscle cells attached to a nerve that it just can't generate enough acetylcholine to feed those muscle membrane end plates, right? But really, um, myasthenia gravis is kind of an immune attack on your neuromuscular junction is the classic neuromuscular junction disorder, right? And you do this repetitive stimulation and the amplitude goes down a whole bunch. You got to pick a muscle where the person's weak or you'll miss it. And EMG is pretty good, but not perfect, okay? There's another disorder that folks interested in cancer need to be very aware of, which is myasthenic, myasthenic syndrome or Lambert Eaton myasthenic syndrome or, or LEMS, L-E-M-S, right? And so this is the person where you, you, you think you're just doing a carpal tunnel workup and you shock their hand and the median motor response is kind of low, two microvolts. You shock it again, it's three, two, three. It, it, the, it varies. What's going on? So you then have the person exercise their muscle real hard for 30 seconds and shock them. And there it is back up to eight. It's normal. Okay. So by exercising the muscle, they get all the stuff going at the neuromuscular junction and all of a sudden they get a big response. And sometimes this myasthenic syndrome found on EMG is the very first finding of cancer. It's not always related to cancer, but pretty darn often, sometimes often enough people with lung cancer, especially, uh, will uh, get weak and weak and weak and we'll find out that it's a uh, myasthenic syndrome and uh, that can be treated separately from the cancer itself in some ways, but getting rid of the cancer is the best treatment. So here we go on top, this is repetitive stimulation of somebody with myasthenia gravis and the very first wave is what it's normal. And then two, three, four, they all drop down and yeah, that doesn't look good, okay? Uh, the second one is an ex uh, a picture of Lambert Eaton myasthenic syndrome, okay? You stimulate the person, then they exercise this person for 10 seconds, and there you get this nice, big, robust response, okay? And so if your clinical suspicion is there, you're going to do repetitive stimulation. Here's the basics of a nerve conduction study, and I've got a video that walks through the EMG machine in some detail, but what you have is an electrode over the muscle, which we call the active electrode or the E1 when you're being fancy an electrode over something else like a tendon or a bone or a finger, whatever that isn't the muscle. Because when that, oopsie, when that muscle depolarizes, 
it's creating an electrical difference. And if you've got a difference there and nothing over a, a tendon, you, you can have a flow of electron between those two, electro, uh, two electrodes. So those two electrodes need to be amplified right away close to the skin because by the time you got them into the computer, there's so much other electrical noise, you'd never see it. So there's always a little box called a preamplifier. In the preamplifier, there's another thing called the ground. And what the ground is, it's not really a ground like an electrician thinks of it. It's a, a common mode rejection electrode. This is an electrode that sees all the ambient electricity from the airplanes flying overhead and the fluorescent lights and the x-ray machine down the hall, the same as the other two electrodes do. But you flip that signal over and it cancels it out, okay? So it's like a, a noise canceling uh, earphones, fancy earphones, okay? Then they get really amplified. They get put through filters, and, and today's not a good day to talk about filters, but, but uh, you want to have uh, get rid of background noise on one side or the other of the main waveform, okay? If you only have high frequency stuff, you get a sharp picture. If you only have low frequency stuff, you get a stretched out picture, and you want just the same as everybody else does. So there's standards about how you look at filters. And then it gets thrown up to the video screen where you can watch it, and, and you rookies, you're watching the EMG, but I'll tell you what, with a needle EMG, I'm not watching, I'm listening. I mean, I'm watching, but just for fun. I'm listening because your ear is excellent at picking up <clears throat> the sounds that normal and abnormal motor mutants make, a fibrillation sound characteristic, positive wave sound characteristic. And after you've been listening long enough, you, you can be in another room and go, whoops, that person's got myotonic dystrophy. Whoa, that's kind of cool, right? It, it's literally like that, okay? So the listening part is something you want to pay attention to. Um, so look, let's say this is your thumb. I stimulate at the wrist. There's an anode and a cathode, and the cathode is the plus, and it's what causes the stimulation. So the stimulation starts here. So you can measure the distance from here to there. For motor studies, it's almost always eight centimeters for the, for the first one. But then... You go further up in the forearm and you stimulate and you get another wave response. It took a little bit longer to get to the muscle. So you look at, how, look at how long it took here. Look at how long it took this longer one. Subtract one from the other and you get the distance of the, the time it takes to go from one electrode to the other, which is a pretty precise thing. You get your tape measure out and you measure the distance. And uh, velocity is you know, distance over time, right? And so you come up with the conduction velocity. Two numbers you got to remember, even if you're not an EMG geek. In the upper limbs, nerve conductions are always greater than 50 meters per second, or there's something wrong. In the lower limb, mo uh, nerve conduction is always 40 meters per second or faster, or there's something wrong. Okay, so get, you, those are just really basic numbers you need to get. Sensory nerve conductions are picking up not over a great big fat muscle, but over a little skinny nerve fiber in the finger or the foot or something like that. And you put these electrodes any place over the sensory fiber, and, and we standardize where you put them for certain studies, but you can, you can come up with a new plan if you want to, okay? Same thing, uh, electricity, when you shock here at 14 centimeters usually, but not always, uh, electricity passes under the first electrode before it passes under the second electrode. So the first electrode sees something, it sucks the electricity up on the screen, then it passes and the second electrode sees it, but that's, that brings it down to the bottom of the screen. So a sensory nerve often has a waveform, something like that, okay? But they're kind of little. So usually when I'm being really good and technical, I do the onset latency for a sensory. The motor studies, we always look at the onset of the big waveform because that's pretty easy and consistent. The sensory ones, there's often background noise. So I wouldn't criticize somebody at all if they just measured to the peak because that's pretty e pretty consistent to look at. I try to look at the onset latency, which, you know, if a sensory nerve has a, a 10,000 nerve fibers, that's the fastest one. Those are the most myelinated fast fibers. And I try to look at that to look for a myelination problem. And you look at the amplitudes, right? There are two ways that we can echo across the spinal cord. Uh, you can, and I have a number of times, you can put a needle down in next to the spinal canal and give a shock and make the arm twitch and measure how long that takes. I suspect you won't do that. And I don't do it often. I have a few reasons why I do that. But there are two ways you can do that without putting a needle in there. One is called the F wave. And this is all one motor axon. It turns out if you shock a motor axon, electricity goes towards the muscle, but it also goes the other direction. There's no direction signal on that motor axon. 
And about 10% of the motor axons that you, you know, if you shock a whole nerve, about 10% of them will echo around the anterior horn cell and for completely non-physiologic reasons, come bouncing back. So you get a measure of how long it takes to go from your shock spot to the spinal cord and down to the hand or the foot or wherever your, your, your pickup is, okay? And you can do F waves in any muscle in the human body. And that's a way to look for thoracic outlet syndrome or other causes. It's also kind of look cool for looking at whether a polyneuropathy is demyelinating because myelin is what makes the nerve move fast. And this is a very, getting a long measure, you can tell better whether somebody's faster than somebody else in a longer race than in a shorter race, okay? Turns out F weights aren't very helpful for the other things that we commonly see. They're not real helpful for carpal tunnel syndrome or cervical root lesions or ulnar neuropathy. Um, so I'll do them often enough to get that central F conduction velocity, or I'll do them in somebody where I'm looking at polyneuropathy, but for compressive neuropathies or damaged nerves, they're not so useful. The H wave is a different beast. It's basically electrically doing the Achilles tendon reflex, except instead of tapping the tendon, you shock the tibial nerve in the popliteal space, okay? So you're shocking the sensory fibers. It goes past the dorsal root ganglion. You get a monosynaptic reflex to the, to the motor nerve, okay? And at a very submaximal power, the sensory fibers are more sensitive than the motor fibers. And so this will happen. And when you jack it up fully, usually it disappears. The H wave is a very consistent thing. Um, it is useful in diagnosing, well, it's only, this, only the S1 nerve. It's useful in diagnosing an S1 radiculopathy. And it's another good way to look at the whole length of a nerve to see if things are slow or fast. It's not bad all by itself as a screening test for polyneuropathies, for instance. Um, EMG for spine disorders is a special piece of my interest and it's, it's actually becoming a, a very important tool these days because MRIs are so full of false positives. If you use a technique that I'll come back to technically, which my team invented called paraspinal mapping, it, false positives are very, very positive. Um, the uh, sensitivity is for a herniated disc is as good as an MRI. Uh, MRI show you a picture about whether the, the, the radiculopathy is caused by a tumor or something like that. But if your question is, I wanna do a test to say you don't have a herniated disc, uh, if it's important to do, you do the EMG and if it's negative, eh, <clears throat> it's as good as an MRI with, with no false positives. Um, we're poking people and shocking them. And in the last year, I don't remember a person that wanted me to stop, okay? Kind of because I talk to him and I'm nice to him and I relax and I explain things and I use some other techniques. People look at it as some sort of torture test and it's not that much fun to go through it. It honestly isn't, but it's so safe. It's so safe in the history of the world since World War II, the whole literature is full of a, a, a handful of punctured lungs, okay? Anything else, nerve damage, need nothing, nothing. Handful of punctured lungs in, 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 in the world literature, okay? So even though it's a bit of a pain, uh, it is safer than MRIs, believe it or not. Uh, and it's actually pretty well tolerated as long as you're not a jerk doing the test, okay? What's really important when you're looking at a spinal disorder is who says it's a spinal disorder? You got pain radiating down into your leg. How come it's not a, a, a pelvic tumor? Hmm? How come it's not mechanical back pain with a fibular head lesion or with diabetic neuropathy that affects one leg more than another, right? And an MRI of the spine will never, ever, ever find those things, right? So the other value is that EMG picks up other causes for the radiating aspect of a pain. Uh, when we did a prospective study of people who were screened to not have neuropathy, to not have other diseases, the like risk for neuropathy, and we thought had spinal stenosis or were asymptomatic volunteers or 150 people. And seven of them, we picked up a nerve disease on the EMG, even though we screened for it elsewhere. Uh, I'll never remember, I'll never forget a lady named Kathleen, uh, who turned out at the age of 72 had Charcot-Marie Tooth disease. They were operating on her back for Charcot-Marie Tooth peripheral neuropathy, right? So it's really important for spinal workups to be sure you're not missing something else. Um, uh, some people will say, is this a first line test? Well, in the United States, it's not because I'll get sued. Uh, it actually can be anyhow, and many of us do, but, but I'm joking. 
people are so obsessed with getting a photograph that it's hard to do an EMG and say that's enough. Somebody else is going to order that darn MRI. Uh, in Africa and the rest of the world, it sure should be. Even when you're looking at dangerous diseases like cancer or infections, uh, an x-ray sedimentation rate in an EMG probably pick up the vast majority of things. And it's a lot uh, easier and more accessible than, than that very expensive MRI. Um, EMG is really important when your clinical hypothesis about what's wrong doesn't match what the MRI says. MRI shows severe lumbar stenosis and you're like, it's the sacroiliac joint. Well, you're an expert, you can ignore that. But the patient's saying, my doctor says I need to have my cervical and lumbar spine fused into one big bone. You know, you do an EMG, you say, guess what? The, there's no nerve damage, you know, right? It's kind of useful that. A lot of research, we've done some, and other people have copied us on this, show that when you do the EMG and your paraspinal mapping shows that it's the L4 nerve root, uh, then an epidural injection at L4 is more effective than somebody doing it based on clinical guess. Other people have shown that surgery directed by the results of paraspinal mapping EMG uh, can be less invasive with the same outcomes, okay? So this specifically localizing the nerve root instead of looking at the MRI and deciding how many roots you want to attack from the EMGs is very valuable for us surgical friends. Um, when you have the patient who's not giving you a clear story or an exam that's kind of ambiguous because their big toe hurts and you don't know they're weak and it matters, you know, the EMG clears that up. So if you are just confused about what's going on, it's a useful test that way. And there are times when you not, we need to know how long ago the injury was, right? So a guy, this is an American model, but a guy hurt his, himself, had a herniated disc 18 years ago playing tennis and recovered completely. And he herniates a disc or has leg pain with an injury at work, which is compensable by our workers' comp system. You do an EMG and you see fibrillations that are big. Well, those are fibrillations from muscle cells that have exercised recently, right? So those aren't the old injury. It, no, this is a new injury from work. It's not as old tennis injury, right? There's other reasons for that. Uh, also, the, the severity, of course, can tell you if, if, if there's nothing working after somebody gets in a motorcycle accident and stretches their brachial plexus out and there's no muscle cells firing, that's bad. And we can talk in some detail about brachial plexus severity, which is a really critical question. Not right now. Um, it's, there are limits, though. Uh, for instance, the speed of conduction in carpal tunnel doesn't correlate with symptoms or prognosis. It just says you have the disease. Um, when you're doing testing, when you're looking at a test from a neurophysiologist, you want to take a look at the quality. And there are a lot of aspects of it. Are you good at doing the single test? Are you good at doing the median sensory fibers to the fourth digit with a ring electrode? Okay. Did that test get interpreted right? Uh, the conduction velocity was 37 and the doctor said it was normal. No, 50 is normal. Okay. Then you sort of look at each of these tests and say, well, what is the sensitivity of that conduction velocity to carpal tunnel syndrome? Okay. But that's not enough because what you're doing now is you're looking at all these different tests. So um, comparing it to the ulnar nerve on the same finger, median nerve, ulnar nerve is much more sensitive than just doing the median nerve by itself. Okay. Or if I stick a needle in the biceps and I see fibrillations, that could be a C5 radiculopathy, but is that enough? Well, if you got the deltoid and the supraspinatus, which are C5, 6, and they're all normal, and you get the brachioradialis and it also lights up like a Christmas tree, like you're not the brachioradialis, good heavens, the coracobrachialis, you go, that's a musculocutaneous nerve lesion. It's not a C5, 6, right? So there's a question of, did the constellation of tests answer all the questions that you thought were there? Did you surround anything abnormal with something normal? Okay. So you find a bunch of abnormal stuff in the arm and you say it's an arm problem. Maybe you need to check a leg to be sure that it's not the whole body that's sick, right? Uh, you, you, you think it's an L5 radiculopathy because you test a couple of leg muscles that are L5, but they're all distal to the fibular head. Maybe it's a peroneal nerve lesion. Show me a muscle that's normal and show me that this is, you know, right? Go do the tensor fascia lata and that's L5, that's L4, 5. And if that's also abnormal, then it's not a peroneal nerve palsy, right? So you do that kind of thing. And then you really take a look at the global picture. Did the doctor get it when they did their history and physical exam? Did they come up with a differential diagnosis that you would agree with to answer the question? And then there's a lot of other things you do to see if it's helpful. Um, so in the US, 
We had the American Board of Electrodiagnostic Medicine, which is the premier board, really difficult tests. Uh, people use technicians. Um, uh, my professors who are old um, would yell at me if I used a technician because there's so much you learn by examining the patient and they don't speed you up very much. You'll see people you know, send the patient off for the technician to do the nerve conduction studies and then come in and do the needle exam. Uh, that's pretty bad quality unless you spend a couple of years training that technician to look for things like anomalies, to be sure that they understand that a cold hand slows down conduction velocity. Uh, you know, and, and, and even then, if you told the technician what to do and they find something funny, do they jump right over and look to confirm it, right? So there's a lot of clinical medicine. Someone can train a technician to do a good job. At University of Michigan, our technicians were brilliant. Uh, I didn't argue with tests that they did. I still thought I did a better job without them, okay? Um, EMGs take a while. Um, I've been around a long time. Um, a simple carpal tunnel workup is a half an hour for me. Although I stretch it out because I really do a neurologic consultation at the same time. So I'm scheduling them for one an hour, including a pretty comprehensive neurologic com consultation and uh, carpal tunnel workup or something like that. Um, and, um, you know, when you get really fancy, you look at EMG labs that have other doctors looking at what they're doing or uh, outcome based quality checks. And when you see that, you know, you're dealing with a doctor that's doing a great job. In the US, EMG makes pretty good money. And as a re result, there has been huge fraud. There was one federal case against one company for a billion dollars worth of fraudulent EMGs, one company, which was providing clinical services, right? They were basically doing an EMG on everybody every time they showed up for renal dialysis, right? Abusive, uh, but it makes a lot of money. So you'll see a lot of people taking a lot of shortcuts on it. Um, a patient should, you know, you, you should see that the nerve conductions were done by the physician or by a really well done uh, technician. Um, you know, the, I've had patients, I, I've actually had a patient who had a report from an EMG that said they tested 10 muscles each on four limbs. And I asked the guy, well, what, that must've hurt a lot. He goes, that didn't hurt. Oh, well, I just put a needle in my hand and let my leg and took it out. That's not enough. You poke around in four different directions with that needle. Okay. And then you have the patient gradually tense up the muscle a little bit to with the needle in it to look for the Modi units. You can't look at Modi units unless you tense up the muscle. And you can't look at Modi units when somebody tenses up, let's go. Because how do you tell 10 different Modi units, right? Um, and, and then obviously looking at the report, look at the history and physical and the differential diagnosis. Skin temperature is a big deal. If uh, uh, the skin is cold below 32 degrees centigrade, it slows down conduction and it makes sensory amplitudes taller, okay? So if a hand is cool, the best thing is to warm it up with hot water or a hot pack or a bean bag that's put in a microwave. Uh, the second best thing is to actually measure the skin temperature and do math that says two, two meters per second per degree centigrade below 32, which is way too much math for me right now. Um, you know, if a physician is always doing the same report all the time, uh, that suggests that they're just being a machine, they're not thinking hard. I'm giving you folks a copy of my Excel spreadsheet I use, which has the classic workup from which I deviate. So the fact that I have a format and a classic workup doesn't mean that I'm constantly doing something different when I need to, right? And you need real numbers and you need to look at what's normal, what's abnormal and how they lead to the conclusion, not just carpal tunnel syndrome, but median nerve slowing across the wrist, but not above the wrist suggests to me that there is carpal tunnel syndrome. That's a fancy report, right? So this is a lot. The accompanying thing I have is a video of me doing some EMG and walking through the machine on myself. And so you'll look forward to that. Um, still can't ask you any questions or vice versa. We'll stop here and we'll get this uh, video to you. Bye-bye.